the Owl House Season 3, thanks to them. You've waited long for this breakdown, you see how long it is. Let's waste no time getting to the nitty gritty. Hit it! We pick up exactly where we left off, as Luz and her friends are expelled from the Demon Realm, and are left stranded on Earth. The status of the Boiling Isles and its inhabitants are still unknown by the end of this episode. We do not get a single peek into what's happened with King, Ida, Rain, Lilith, and so many other characters, as they're subjected to the chaotic force from beyond the stars. That is the Collector. Seeking refuge, the kids end up at Camila's door, allowing Luz to finally reunite with her mom. Also, I definitely mentioned this in the King's Tide breakdown, but Amphibious and Boonchoy makes a cameo through an article on Camila's iPad, questioning if Anne's disappearance is a hoax. Now, slight spoilers for Amphibia, but this gag, while not meant to be taken super seriously, I'm sure, is actually pretty consistent with the end of the series where a handful of Earth's population actually believes that the climax of the series is a hoax. There's a total of four amphibia easter eggs throughout this episode, with the other three being a snail that looks like Bessie appearing during the rain sequence in the opening montage, Luz having a doodle of Polly in one of her notebooks when daydreaming about the form of her talisman, which feels like a very intentional choice since Polly's whole arc is built around metamorphosis. Hop Hop is spotted on a poster at the clinic Camila works at, which is also something I think could add up with Amphibia itself, since Hop Hop already became the star of a commercial while he was on Earth, so what's stopping him from being a pet clinic model at some point? And last, but certainly not least, someone's wearing a grime costume at the Gracefield Halloween party, which would be a sick costume in real life. I hope I see someone actually dress up as him this year. I wish Disney TVA was able to get into the Halloween market so bad, because if you've been to a spirit Halloween in the last five to six years, then you know that franchises like Rick and Morty, Steven Universe, Kingdom Hearts, and so many others sell costumes and accessories. And while some of the costumes like masks or wigs can be horrifying, oh. it's pretty Pretty cool to be able to buy stuff like Steven's shield, Rick's portal gun, or various keyblades. Which just makes for cool decor more than anything else for me. And imagine being able to buy official palisman staffs, glyphs, toad armor, and so on. We're being robbed of good merch, man. Robbed! Luckily, the mysteryshack.com has a lot of great unofficial merch. Not sponsored. Gus, Willow, and Amity help Camila around the house, leading to a brief but heartwarming moment where Amity is clearly shy and nervous around Camila because she doesn't want her girlfriend's mom to have a bad first impression of her. And Camila, without even saying a word, is able to provide reassurance. It felt like she already picked up on Luz and Amity being a thing. And that's what we call Mother's Intuition. This season premiere is centered around the fallout of not just King's Tide, but Hollow Mine. The episode where Luz and Hunter learned about Luz's role as an unknowing pawn in Bells' game by helping him when he was Philip Wittabane back in Elsewhere and Elsewhen. And lest we forget that this episode also revealed the truth about Hunter's identity as a Grimwalker, a clone of Philip's older brother, Caleb. Both afraid of how their loved ones will react to this news, they've been doing their best to keep it secret. But obviously things have gone from bad to worse, amplifying that fear tenfold, doubling down to protect the shocking truth from their friends. But unbeknownst to them, Gus at the very least is aware about Hunter after reading Bellos' mind. This is alluded to later in the episode, but isn't fully explored here, but they would include that scene for no reason. So Gus's knowledge of Bellos and what really happened to Caleb is something that might play a pivotal role in one of the latter two specials. Despite Camila's reassurance, unfortunately, they do have a reason to be afraid. Despite watching the Collector splatter Bellos across the walls in what was a very horrifying yet cathartic moment of the show, the Emperor has survived, as a chunk of his goopy remains is still alive and conscious, making the trip to Earth with everyone else. Gus and Hunter set up their sleeping arrangements in the basement, and you already know the president of the Human Appreciation Society was going to waste zero time before diving into the sea of human objects lying around. We also see Hunter's scout instincts at work as he strategically plans out his sleeping bed. It's kind of amusing how into it he is. Bro saw his uncle get Bill Nied from a solid to a liquid, and he's making sure he sleeps all of that trauma off. Loses stress when the first episode appears, but is still stained hanging above a sewing machine, so Camila is either going to repair it and then wash it, or just hasn't gotten to it yet. There's a few details related to Luz's late father throughout the basement. There's a box labeled Manny, a box that says Playa, which is Spanish for beach, and this box is indeed full of beach day things, such as a towel, sunscreen, a snorkel mask, and an American flag. So I'm assuming Luz, Manny, and Camila went to the beach every 4th of July. And there's a framed photo of Camila and Manny's wedding day. There's also nods to Camila's job as a vet with a bird 
bird cage, a frame of a fish, and a fake lizard for decor. Also, I need to take the L from a few videos ago. This is a Dominican flag. I goofed and called it the France flag in a promo breakdown, but from this angle, it's clearly the Dominican flag, and plenty of comments corrected me. How did that mix up happen? Because I can be dumb. Simple as that. They didn't teach me world flags in public school. They just taught me about old dudes in American history I didn't care about because I wanted to go home and play Sonic fan games. Hunter thanks Camila by getting on his knee, which makes her insanely uncomfortable. Showing the contrast between Hunter, who's used to doing this every day as a sign of respect before his leaders, and Camila, who definitely sees it as strange because that's not something too common in our modern day society, especially in America, and given the symbolism attached to taking a knee in recent years, Camila low-key might have found it to be a little tone-deaf, even though she knows the boy means well. Camila checks in on Abby and Willow, who are staying in Lucy's room alongside V. The girls destroy an alarm clock after misinterpreting its noise, and a super sweet detail is V's note outside of Luce's room that reads, Welcome home, Luce! We missed you! Camila finds her daughter at the end of the hallway in front of a bunch of family photos. These photos include Luce's middle school graduation, a few photos of Luce, Manny, and Camila together, Luce at one of her birthdays, Luce marking her height on the wall, baby Luce being tossed up to the air by Camila with Manny's hand also in frame, Luce cosplaying what looks like Cat Noir with a few legal liberties, Camila cannonballing into a pool, hinting at her carefree, goofy side that we learn more about later in this episode, Luce on Christmas, and so much more. Luce begins to profusely apologize to her mother for running away to the demon realm, frantically trying to explain herself, but Camila, being the very understanding mother she actually is, reassures Luce that she's just happy she's safe and sound. But Luce finds it hard to be relieved when her friends are now the ones far from home. This takes us to the opening montage that both acts as our time skip and theme song for the special, featuring an extended, remixed version of that banger intro. I wonder if each special is going to have its own little intro or montage, but honestly, with Disney posting this montage as the season 3 intro straight up, I think the theme song will be absent from the following two specials for the sake of time. They'll probably just have the super short intro that cuts right to the logo, or just flash the logo like in King's Tide. Don't get me wrong though, I'd love to see a full-fledged weirdmageddon s intro for the other two specials where everything gets distorted by Bellows and the Collector. Keeping my hopes low though. Out of everything that we lost out in a full season 3, not to dwell on what could have been, not knowing what an Earth intro actually would have looked like, probably hurts the most. Breaking down this montage, on my third time watching this special, I noticed how it immediately parallels the season 1 intro, where instead of the portal door flying at the screen while opening on its own, the first thing we see here is the door of the abandoned house open as the kids set foot into their new base of operations. Also, I usually refer to this house as the old Wittabane house, and while this episode doesn't necessarily confirm or deny anything, it does seem to lean into the idea that maybe this house belonged specifically to Caleb, but more on that later. The Lumity ship name is embraced in the show's canon, as Luz presents a video by Lumity Studios to her mother, a coming out video comprised of photos that depict the growth of her relationship with Amity and explaining to her mom that she's bisexual. Seeing them mutually fangirl over the Good Witch Azura books was probably the sweetest photo in the bunch. The other pals may notice Flapjack diligently searching for something, which we later learn is the map leading to Evelyn and Caleb's stash of Titan's blood. Again, I always believed this was the old Winnebane house, but this solidifies that at the very least, this house was owned by Caleb. I'm now questioning if Philip ever even lived in it, and if this home was actually just for Caleb up in Evelyn in particular. A vacation home for Evelyn, because its presence in the woods parallels it with the Owl House. The show isn't being subtle about Evelyn being an ancestor of Ida's, and that the two share quite a bit in common. So really, while being stranded on Earth, the squad swapped one Owl House for another. The kids decide to boost morale by sprucing up the place, hanging up doodles of their families waiting back home. And my favorite detail of this moment is definitely how Amity drew Alador, Edric, and Emera, but she left out she who will not be named. Oh, Dahlia the prick. Meanwhile, Hunter's the only one empty-handed, planting the seed for his conversations with Gus and Flapjack later in the episode, around him having nothing left in the demon realm, and how he's been much happier on Earth. Hunter's arc is clearly heading towards a certain direction, but we'll touch on that a bit more later in the video. Also a cute little detail, a possum rips through their sketch of a portal door, and immediately Amity's palisman Ghost chases after it. 
She's the only palisman with a smirk on her face. Very true to the nature of cats. The gang dabbles in fashion as Willow wears a tank top of Mabel's iconic shooting star sweater from Gravity Falls. Amity's hat and purple color scheme makes her look a lot like Vivian from Paper Mario, and Hunter's dressed up in a cardinal costume. Foreshadowing how he and Flapjack become one, thanks to Flapjack's sacrifice at the end of this episode. V also gets a new look, with light green and dark blue two-toned hair, alongside yellow pupils, based off of her color scheme as a basilisk. It gives me, like, Sonic characters as humans energy, Sonic characters as humans energy, but that's a compliment, I mean that in the best way possible. Hunter seems to be looking for answers about his origins by obtaining a book about the Witch Hunters of Grayfield, closing the medicine cabinet in the bathroom shut as his reflection in the mirror shifts from himself to Caleb Wittabane to Emperor Bellows mean mugging his nephew. A look that expresses intense anger and disappointment. Bellows feels betrayed once more, and he's out for blood. Now, in context with the rest of the episode, and how Bellows' essence would influence Hunter to see visions of his uncle, this moment could be a sign that Hunter's brief contact with the essence of Bellows at the end of King's Tide was already leading to psychological effects on Hunter. This crisis prompts Hunter to frantically cut his long hair before being caught by Willow. Hunter looking like his prototype character, Prince William! And adding fuel to the ship's fire, Willow takes over and gives Hunter a proper haircut. Jumping forward a bit, Hunter's rockin' the Rocco's Modern Life Drip as the gang try to create a portal back to the Demon Realm. But without any Titan's blood, things seem to be hopeless. Now, Lubity dancing in the rain is some of the cutest shit I've ever seen in my life. But there's one thing about this scene that really perplexes me. Amity is acting as if she's cautious of the rain, which makes sense due to the occurrence of boiling rain back on the aisles. But the beginning of this episode shows that it was already raining when they got to Earth. Now look, I get it, it's just a cute moment for the sake of a cute moment, but it doesn't make any sense. And recognizing it's just supposed to be a cute moment won't stop it from throwing me out of the episode every time I watch it now. It's not that big of a deal, but I felt like I had to mention it. When the rest of the gang joins Limity in the rain, the mud covering Hunter's head kinda makes him look like Monster Bellows. Notice that the mud ends at his shoulders too, making it look like Bellows' hair in that state, a visual easter egg of what's to come later in the special. Amity creates a ball of light to help Luz mimic the series' main opening, which transitions into Luz, failing to activate a light lift that's surrounded by countless doodles of Ida, King, and Hootie, more of which Luz has above her desk. She clearly misses them. And remember, without the presence of a Titan, or as we learn in this episode, Titan's blood in itself, Glyphs do not work on Earth. There's also a sticky note on Luz's corkboard that reads, Love you, Luz, signed by Amity. Aww. Still pursuing her education, Luz spots the arrival of the school bus and grabs both her backpack and her unhatched palisman egg. As the camera follows the trail of leaves blowing in the wind, we get the fabulous Owl House logo, which now adds a fierce orange glow to the Alper emblem. Back at the abandoned house, the gang is seen practicing Spanish on an app that looks a lot like Duolingo. This isn't just a deep cut, people. It's a meme cut. Since season one of the show, Duolingo's social media has expressed a fondness for the series, even pushing the pairing of Duolingo and Hootie. Yes, you heard me right. Also, Duolingo is evil in this universe, I guess. Probably another layered meme reference. During this Spanish lesson, Amity remarks, I was the top student once. Referencing her academic status at the beginning of the series, back when her and Luz were far from girlfriends. I like when they have these little moments that retain her competitive side, while also reminding us that she's come a long way. Everyone has an updated look after the time skip. Luz has longer hair that shows off her coral pattern, alongside her scar and Ida's grudge jacket. Camila has a gray streak of hair, which I'm sure is a result of stress from raising six kids over the past few months. And like Luz, she also has curlier hair. At one point in the episode, we can actually see that she threw out her flat iron, hinting that spending time with the kids has led to Camila embracing her natural hair. She's also wearing a heart-shaped rainbow flag pin, presumably showing allyship, but I don't know. Maybe she'll get the hots for Ida or something. Who wouldn't? Willow's new shirt has the Animal Crossing leaf on it, with the colors of her pants and long sleeve resembling that of a tree. 
Gus is wearing the magic amplifier he took from Adrian Gray as an earring, alongside a jacket. Hunter kinda just looks like Arthur, but really he's wearing the comfy Earth version of the Golden Guard fit. Finally, Amity is wearing an abomination colored shirt, and overall similar to the color of the Hexide uniform, and lest we forget her longer hair, which exposes more of her roots as her hair dye is beginning to run out. Hunter is taking an interest in sewing, as it's something that makes him feel connected to his true father figure, Darius. A reminder of how Darius repaired the Golden Guard cloak and kept Flatjack's secret back in any sport in a storm. Flapjack's pecking creates a hole in the floor that Amity trips into, revealing that the palisman was really searching for this box. The color of said box is confirmed to be a nod to the journals from Gravity Falls. Over at Graysfield High, Luce is sitting in class with her palisman egg in her lap, and from this angle, it kinda looks like a sleeping snake. I'd argue that this is another hint. The topic of discussion in Luce's class, as written on the chalkboard, is fate versus free will, the plight of the hero which has more or less been a huge theme of the Owl House. Front and center here, as Luz projects onto the protagonist of the book they're reading, expressing through the material that she feels as if she's ruined her friends' lives, and that everything would be better if she never existed. Luz thought she was acting on her own free will, but her assisting Bellows was always set in stone. It was fate. However, she's failing to look at the bigger picture. She doesn't question if fate has her friends returning home in store, if everything is destined to work out in the end. She has the opposite problem of Bellows, whose arrogance and god complex has deluded him into believing that he's fated to destroy all witches in order to save mankind. We got a little callback to the series premiere as Graysfield High's art room strictly prohibits things such as taxidermy, spiders, snakes, and fireworks, which were a part of Luce's previous book reports and art projects. Luce's locker has a few notable details. There's numerous drawings of Ida and King, including young Ida with her bright orange hair. The two ground photos can be spotted on the side, the newspaper of Ida getting banned from a cafe for wreaking havoc, which first appeared in the season 2 episode Yesterday's Lie, and finally, there's a sketch of the light cliff. Now, whoever has a locker nest to lose gotta be confused as hell, trying to figure out what anime her locker is themed after. Two students approach Luz and invite her to the Graysfield Haunted Hayride. These students are actually based off of crew members Mike Austin, aka the homie Mike Cat SU, and Bridget Underwood. As Camila drives Luz home from school, we catch some of her conversation with Luz as she tries to figure out satisfying alternatives for witch cuisines, but they're interrupted by the sight of a car accident where a woman claims to have hit a deer, but her daughter firmly believes that it's a monster. The camera pans over and reveals the bones of a dead deer with green muck dripping from the horns, conveying to the audience that Emperor Bellows has been possessing and feeding off of wildlife. Over in the Noseta household, Hunter sews together a shirt of his new favorite animal, wolves! Fun fact, this shirt actually exists in real life. However, our boy slips up and accidentally punctures a hole through his finger. This wound would turn out to be our boy's downfall, as it later allows Muck Bellows to directly enter his bloodstream. Hunter and Gus have a heart-to-heart -heart that's prompted by Gus pointing out that Hunter seems way happier in the human realm. And I think this is exactly where Hunter will stay at the end of the series. His conversation with Gus reveals that he has nothing left waiting for him in the demon realm. He was just comfortable there because he had Bellows to tell him who to be. It wasn't something he had to think about, but he wasn't really happy in the Emperor's Coven. Bellows isolated him from his peers, and he was only allowed to leave the castle on weekends for missions. Which kinda explains why he was absent until the very end of Season 1. Hunter staying on Earth would be a powerful message, as we would not only see him continue to carve out his identity, but it conveys to the audience that you don't need to stay in the same place a traumatic event happened in order to heal. The conversation between these two brothers about mothers ends up reminding Gus of the Cosmic Frontier novels he's begun to read. Cosmic Frontier being a clear parody of franchises such as Star Trek and Star Wars, but mainly Star Trek, as evident by the character design. Hunter questions why anyone would want to go into space, which is ironic since Collector is said to be a child of the stars. This makes me wonder if we'll learn anything about the cosmos in the demon realm, and if there's time to learn about the Collector's origin. One of the characters in Cosmic Frontier is a clone who goes by the name of Chief Engineer O'Bailey, which might be a nod to the series head writer, John Bailey Owen. 
Gus reveals that he's found a closet full of Manny's and presumably Camila's cosplay and collectibles. Being a cool nerd just runs in the family. Lou struggles to fall asleep as the overhead decor of her bed taunts her with its visual similarity to the collector. And as she walks off into her mom's room, she unknowingly wakes up Amity, who finds Lou's invite to the haunted hayride. In Camila's room is a book titled Life Ain't Binary, showing that she's even doing research on gender identity, and we see that she's still figuring out what to feed the kids. And I guess that in the demon realm, apple blood comes from the apple butcher, which suddenly makes me feel weird about apples in the boiling aisles. Do they live in fear? Do they feel pain? Camila falls asleep and has a dream flashback combo that gives us a look into Luz's social struggles growing up. We learn that Camila has always stuck up for Luz in her quirks. She's always been endeared by the things that other parents were repulsed by, like how Luz had an adoration for shedded snakeskin, which is also another association between Luz and snakes. We witness a school play from the first episode again, but this time from Camila's perspective. There's an asshole wearing a Charlie Brown shirt behind Camila. I hope that guy has a bad day. It really does seem like Manny was a big goofball, as Camila says. Her dad taught her that one. When Luce's fake guts burst out of her chest, which is crazy because this is one of the first things we actually saw pertaining to Luce, and it was inspired by her dad all of this time. We then see Camila meet with the principal, who believes Luce's behavior is the result of her grieving. She has no friends and her grades are inconsistent, information that reframes the Owl House as a story of grief from the very beginning. Though, as a certified neurodivergent lad, bad grades and social issues can just be part of the course. But as Luce's video diary testifies later on in this episode, the bad grades does not mean that you're not applying yourself, but rather, you end up applying yourself to the things that matter to you. We learn that Camila used to be bullied, something that pressures her into setting loose to reality check camp, which was actually the principal's recommendation. Camila was clearly unsure about setting loose to this camp, so in a roundabout way, I think she's glad Luce ended up in another dimension instead. As Camila is awoken by Luce, we can spot a framed photo of Camila and V behind her, which I just find to be the sweetest thing ever. Luz has a heart-to-heart -heart with her mom about running away to the demon realm, Luz questions why her mom isn't mad at her, and how Luz feels as if she's at fault for the situation her friends ended up in. But luckily, Camila gives her the reassurance only a mother can provide. On Camila's nightstand is a framed photo of a snake eating itself, aka the Ouroboros symbol signifying the never-ending cycle of life. Add this to the pile of snake palace been foreshadowing, especially with the egg set right next to it, still looking like a sleeping snake. But because happiness is a lie, we can't end this scene on a positive note, as outside of the Noceda household is a trail of animal bones that lead to Bellos, possessing another carcass in order to continue his mission. This was clearly a carcass before the possession, which makes me wonder if his control over wildlife entails him eating other animals alive. All right, we've already unpacked a lot so far, but I want to take a moment to celebrate you guys. Thank you for supporting the channel. Now it's time to shed the spotlight on you and flex your wonderful art. Let's go!
Amity, Willow, and Gus decide to go on their own adventure to solve the map, putting on human disguises that is probably just an excuse for the designers to give them more outfits in this episode. With Hunter's disguise being less subtle than most, but arguably works well as a cosplay. People aren't gonna look at him and think, which? They're gonna think, damn, the ears for your Cosmic Frontier cosplay are really dope. They're so lifelike. There's an interesting dialogue between Gus and Hunter over the contents of Cosmic Frontier about O'Bailey's secret clone and how Gus believes another character, Captain Avery, actually already knows. But before he can elaborate, Hunter cuts him off in fear of spoilers. I think there's definitely subtext here relating to Gus and Hunter to themselves and how Hunter is desperately trying to hide his true identity as a Grimwalker. But Gus already knows after reading Bells' mind in King's Tide, waiting for Hunter to come out when he's ready rather than putting him on the spot. Amity and Gus get a head start while Hunter stays behind as he takes a moment to reflect on his journey of so discovery finally being comfortable in his own skin. But the moment comes to an abrupt halt when Flapjack notices a bit of Bellows muck. This is where Hunter makes a fatal mistake by letting his scout instincts kick in, inspecting the muck with his open wound finger. This provides the first instance since the opening montage where Hunter begins to see apparitions of Bellows. The Emperor's beast-like silhouette with glowing blue eyes appears in Hunter's reflection, confirming to the Golden Guard that his uncle has managed to survive. But also, where did his bandage go? Why is it back in the very next scene we see? Are you telling me he only took it off so this could happen? Meanwhile, the rest of the Hexite squad goes on an adventure throughout town. They consult the Magic Circle, with three Easter eggs I found worthy of pointing out. There's an illustration of a mouse leading an orchestra with the name Little Maestro, which I believe is either a parody of Disney's Fantasia, starring everyone's favorite, Michael, Michael Mouse, or this apparent book series I found called Maestro Mouse, whose design is actually identical to this guy right here, but maybe it's just the weirdest coincidence ever. There's also a pack of Hexes Hold'em cards, something that first appeared way back in Season 1, so we can assume a copy of this game made its way to Earth, thanks to Ida's shenanigans prior to the witch losing her portal door. Finally, two of the costumes in the shop are clearly Ness's clothes from Earthbound and Akko from Little Witch Academia. Gus and Willow get a good look at the statues of Caleb and Philip, exchanging a concern and seemingly knowing look, as if they're piecing together that this town is the root of a very wicked evil. The kids search the library, which leads to a funny bit where Amity approaches the file cabinet, trying to appease it into opening up like the ones back in the Demon Realm, and getting absolutely spooked when a kid opens one up without second thought. They hit up the zoo, where they come face to face with giraffes, and learn why these animals were banished from the Demon Realm in the first place. Apparently, they're sensitive to flash photography. Giraffes? Oh yeah, we banished those guys. Bunch of freaks. After having a moment where everyone really misses their dads, V decides to pull out her in case of emergency break glass and leads them to the Gracefield Historical Society. But instead of finding Jacob Hopkins inside, they find Masha, who V previously became acquainted with while disguising herself as Luce back in the episode Yesterday's Lie. Masha's nails are painted the color of the non-binary flag, and they use they-them pronouns according to their nameplate. Masha reveals Jacob's been fired thanks to his god complex and insane antics, but he does have a small cameo later on in the episode. These children are demon spawn, and they want your teeth! Masha clarifies that the map is actually Rebus, a puzzle in which words are represented by combinations of pictures and individual letters. Amity, Willow, and Gus realizing that this Rebus will lead them to Titan's blood. And after V realizes that this Rebus aligns with an outdated map of Gracefield, the gang is finally on the right track to getting home. Luz is daydreaming at her mom's clinic about her palisman and what form it will take, with snake imagery outweighing the other animals, and as she packs up to head home, she makes contact with a sketch of a light glyph. The glyph having a very peculiar reaction, as if it was almost activated. Given that Luz is at her mom's job and not at home, this is our first clue that she's way closer to Titan's blood than she realizes. Hunter struggles to come to terms with what he saw earlier, vowing to keep Flapjack safe. Yet Flapjack tries to warn Hunter that Bellows has already begun to infest his body and mind. After meeting up with Luz, the two decide to storm the abandoned house and confront Bellows with some mass confidence. Luz equipped with a red baseball bat that has a striking resemblance to the glyph baseball bat in her beta design. Once the two hit the basement, however, they just find another possum. This brings us to one of the most emotional scenes of the series thus far, as Hunter and Luz confide in each other that they want to keep their friends safe. 
Luce referring to Hunter as family for the very first time. And a sea of people rejoice. As the Lunter ship was deader than it already was, I don't, I don't know why that was even a thing. Overwhelmed with emotion, Hunter breaks down. This past summer meeting Luce has led to Hunter experiencing genuine connections for the very first time. He finally has people who truly love and appreciate him for who he is, not for who he's supposed to be. But as the two exit the basement, we get confirmation that it's too late for Hunter, as Bellows has already begun his possession. Back at Luce's home, Camila gets flustered after seeing the kids get into her Cosmic Frontier collection and various cosplay, and this embarrassment from her really has me hoping that the series ends with Luce and Camila hitting up a convention together, both swagged out in cosplay. Amity pitches a Good Witch Azura couple's costume to Luce, referencing the apparent second movie as inspiration, and as I'm sure many of you recognized, we can spot a Nintendo Switch and ambiguous third-party controller on the entertainment console. Luce's guilt over helping Bellows leads to her recording a video diary in the dead of night. Her desktop background seems to be her own Lumity fan art of the two stargazing, as a watermark reads, at Friends of Owls and Titans. Original art, do not repost! And on her desktop are a few familiar games and apps. Moon Farm Valley, a parody of Stardew Valley, Holler Night, a parody of Hollow Knight, Hades, which is just straight up the game Hades, a game whose animated opening was provided by Spencer Wan's animation studio. Spencer Wan being the animation supervisor on season one of The Owl House. There's also You Movie, which is a clear parody of iMovie, and what Luz probably uses to edit her AMVs on. Luz vents into her video diary and comes to the heartbreaking conclusion that she has to stay on Earth once this is all said and done. The squad pulls up to the Gracefield Haunted Hayride, where Jacob tries to expose the kids for being witches, but instead catches a case. <laughs> On the hayride itself, Masha reveals the tale of the brothers Wittabane, the origin story of Philip and Caleb. In the year 1613, over 400 years ago, the two arrived in town as orphans, with Philip being Caleb's younger brother. Over the years, they adopted the ideology of witch hunters in order to fit in. They needed to conform, which, as I said in my general thoughts of this episode, is a huge detail to have in Bells' backstory, because he himself brought conformity to the Boiling Isles, with the Coven system. Because Caleb was older and thus more emotionally developed than Philip, he was able to recognize witch hunting for how twisted and cruel it actually was, while Philip was successfully indoctrinated into this culture. What Caleb saw right through as unjustified hate, Philip took Took in as the truth. We also learn that the witch the two met along their travels was named Evelyn, someone who's very clearly a clawthorn. Evelyn, Gwendolyn, Edelyn, how did they even get to the name Lilith? Poor girl. No wonder she went and cursed her sister. She just wanted a better name. Evelyn and Caleb fell in love, but Philip just wrote this off as his brother being deceived and brainwashed, embarking on a mission to save him from the demon realm. And the rest, as we know it, is history. Hunter becomes desperate to prove he's not going insane, and that Bellows is really here, exposing the Titan's blood surprise to Luce early. But when she's not fully convinced, Bellows' influence fully shines through, as Hunter commands Flapjack to retreat retrieve the Rebus. It's pretty obvious that Bellows is itching to get back to the Demon Realm as soon as possible after exacting some revenge along the way. But also, I think this struck a nerve because, much like Hunter not being fully believed here, I'm sure Caleb didn't believe Philip when Philip was desperately pleading for his brother to believe that Evelyn is evil. Obviously, Philip was wrong about that. This is just some food for thought. Elsewhere, Camila is cleaning up after the kids when she trips over Luce's baseball bat, causing her to literally stumble into Luce's video diaries. Starting at what appears to be two years prior to the series, maybe a year at the least, we see a younger but longer-haired Luce settling into her new room for the first time. She doesn't seem to be too content with her new living arrangements, and is shown to be much more observant than she lets on, as despite her mother's reasons for the move, Luce notes it's because there's a better hospital for her dad nearby, implying that Manny passed away from a terminal illness rather than a sudden accident. The next entry seems to pick up the day of Manny's passing, judging by Camila's immediate reaction to caress the screen, and Luce referring to the worst day ever. Young Noseda trying to remain optimistic as she mentions that Manny left her a book, the first installment of the Good Witch Azora series. The next entry shows that Luz has become completely infatuated with the series, already hanging up posters and drawings of Azora in her bedroom, 
her favorite series. All this time was a parting gift from her father. As Luz continues her hyperfixation with the series, we see that she also started getting into anime. As we can spot a poster for Spirit Devour in the background, a riff on the anime and manga series Soul Eater. Luz has great taste. We learn that Luz's short hair came from her trying to get a fresh cut with the sword, but alas, things horribly backfired. Reaching the start of the series, Luz's room is full of more easter eggs and references, such as the Domicile Sinister 4 poster, aka Resident Evil 4, a sketch of what I believe is Cloud Strife, and a few classic movies. Luz laments over her poor grades and that Camila feels as if she isn't applying herself, but Luz argues that she is applying herself, just to the things she finds interesting like taxidermy and cosplay, not junk like American history or math. Again, as someone with ADHD, this was very relatable, and is actually a pretty common thing with neurodivergent people. We're way more capable than how most people perceive us, but because we tend to gravitate towards things outside of the status quo, it's easy to be written off and cast aside in your younger years, because you have way less of a chance to figure out what you want to do and find something that works for you. Moments like this is why the Owl House is so important to so many people. People who felt rejected by society, and know that even if they don't fit into societal norms, there's other like-minded people out there that they do fit in with, who appreciate them for who they are. Sadly, Camila also overhears Luce's plan to stay on Earth and stay out of her friend's way, afraid that she'll screw things up. But of course, Camila won't let this be. Hunter's fingers seem to be bleeding bellow scoop as he removes a new bandage from it, and while he's getting wrapped up in the chaos of it all, Lou struggles to keep up. Deciding there has to be a better way to find Hunter and the Titan's blood, she has an epiphany. Glyphs don't work on Earth without Titan's blood, so if it tried to activate itself earlier, that must mean she's getting close. Sure enough, her light glyphs are finally starting to work. This brings Luz to the Graysville Graveyard, where she meets Hunter, who's succumbing more and more to Bellus' control. As Luz pieces together that something's very off of her big bro, fighting Flapjack cowering near a tombstone, Bellows Hunter, or uh, Bunter? You know what, he already has a cool design, let's knock him down a few pegs. Bunter makes his presence fully known, with a transformation that's gotta hurt. This possession was foreshadowed in episodes such as Any Sport in a Storm and Hollow Mind. Bunter finds the vial of Titan's blood, which has a cap that sports a striking resemblance to Albert and Hootie. I don't know about you guys, but this tells me that Evelyn might have had a hand in the creation of Hootie and the Owl House, or at least was the one who began the pattern of birthing things in the Clawthorn family. Luz and Bunter begin to battle, but Bellows recognizes that Luz is holding back in fear of hurting Hunter. As the rest of the crew arrives as if on cue, Bellows openly taunts Luz and thanks her for helping him find the Collector, which of course is a shock to her friends. The animation kicks into sicko mode, thanks to Tom Barkle, who also animated a few moments in the back half of season 2. Something I notice is that Ghost's eyes become purple as she enters battle mode. Out of all the palacemen, they definitely gave her the most blink and you miss it detail. Gus reminds Bellows of their encounter in King's Tide, and Willow was able to pin Butcher's arm down long enough for V to fight for the first time. Bellows wanted to find out how Basil is still magic, and he finds out front and center, as V attacks him in a way that I can only describe as Kirby meets a goon from Infinity Train. However, Bellows retaliates, causing this moment to be rather short-lived. Hope we get to see V fight again before the finale, but the ending of this episode doesn't inspire confidence. Luz tries to get through to Hunter, but gets thrown off by Bellows, and as Amity saves her, we can see that she actually uses Earth Mud instead of Abomination Goop. With this, it kinda makes sense that Willow was in the Abomination track before the Plant track, since both seem to be two sides of the same coin. As Bunter snatches Flapjack and attempts to zap his magic, he remarks, Goodbye. Evelyn. Which implies Flapjack might have been a gift from Evelyn to Caleb, or that they carved the bird together. Alternatively, given that Bellows mistakes Hunter for Caleb shortly after, it's possible that he was referring to Luce as Evelyn. But more on that in a bit. After Flapjack is fatally wounded, Hunter begins to fight off the possession and tosses the vial of Titan's blood into the lake. Bunter jumps in the lake after the vial, but tragically begins to drown. This could be a dark nod to Trowel by Water, where accused witches would be thrown into rushing waters, their fates being left to a higher power. Camila retrieves Hunter's body as Bellows forces himself out of the vessel, Hunter's face being covered in new scars where Bellows' essence took over. Meaning just like the animals Bellows possessed throughout the episode, Hunter was also being eaten alive by his uncle. Ugh, Bellows gives no fucks. 
Bells questions why Caleb would stab him in the back, which has me thinking Bells' mind is all jumbled up thanks to the back-to-back -back combo of Gus's mind trick and Collector painting the walls green. This may mean that when Bells returns to the Isles, he won't be able to distinguish his memories from reality. Maybe he'll see Ida as Evelyn, or another witch. He'll mistake the Isles for how it appeared when he first arrived 400 years ago. I don't know, man. Dangerous times ahead. Bellus uses the vial of Titan's blood to create a portal and escape to the Demon Realm, asserting that this is for the good of your souls. I already put a video out on what I think Bellus' plan is. He'll return to the Isles, hijack the Titan's body, and rumble which kind into dust. I'm scared. In the aftermath of the battle, everyone scrambles to Hunter before he passes on, Willow learning in the heat of the moment that Hunter is a Grimwalker. The wounded Flapjack, aware he's already dying, decides to sacrifice himself in order to heal Hunter, becoming one with his best friend. Some real Denji and Poshta antics. Hunter wakes up sporting brown eyes just like Caleb, instead of the pinkish red eyes of a Grimwalker. Now again, I already did my general thoughts of this episode that unpacked Flapjack's death, so go check that out if you haven't. Luz explains her history with Bellows and why she kept it a secret from her friends. But before she declares she's staying on Earth, Camila swoops in to declare. She's joining Luz and the others in the Demon Realm not letting her daughter fight this evil alone now that she knows what they're fighting up against. Also, during this scene, I like to imagine Bellas is just hauling ass and booking it throughout the aisles. Like, not even being discreet, bro is just running for the castle. Amity repeats Luce's speech to her for when Luce first asked her out as she tries to give her girlfriend reassurance for the future. Also, we officially get Good Witch Luce, so theory 50% confirmed. Let's see if the Collector or the Titan give her some temporary power in the finale. V stays behind the cover for Camila, and the special comes to a close, as Luz braces herself for a final confrontation with Bellos. And there you have it, our breakdown of the episode that's just as long as the episode. Drop your thoughts in the comments down below, and keep the conversation going by giving us a follow at Vox and at RoundtableVids on both Twitter and Instagram. Check out Toon Drip, and if you enjoyed this video, please sort a like, and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. See ya!